Are we live again? I think we've sorted it now. Windows has done a nice little update again. Thanks, Windows. Always supporting me in the minimum possible way. <laughs> Will anybody find the stream now? That's the question. Hands up if anyone's here. Sounds good. Excellent. <laughs> How many attempts did that take? Windows had just reset all the sound settings. Great. So I just had to sort all of those out. Oh dear, man. <laughs> Aren't things just going really well? We're only 17 minutes after I was hoping to stop. Oh, Trista's not here because he's just said so. Excellent. <laughs> This was a real Murphy's Law situation. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome back everyone to the second live stream of today. Last 30 second live stream was not particularly great. Hopefully this one will be a bit longer. <laughs> How many times am I going to do this? Today we're taking a look at the Lockmax SC10. Hopefully that's obvious from the title, if you've not seen it already. Because of how familiar it looks compared to the Ender 3 style printers, there's quite a few that look all the same now. I've printed off an end, uh, Benchy, an end, I've printed off an Ender 3. Now, I've printed off a Benchy on the Ender 3 V2 and the original Ender 3, although only like, I mean, it's got a different control board. So it's not totally Ender 3. It's like a 32-bit version. It's got the M, uh, I forgot the name of the board. The Maker Base board that I did a video on a very short while back. Uh... This lot max I am not a backer of. It's not on Kickstarter anymore, is it? I was not aware it was on Kickstarter. This seems like a done deal. So, yes. Uh, this is not the Shark, by the way. This is just the standard SC10 of which I believe you can quite easily buy it because I'm pretty sure I checked this. I did talk to them. It was probably four, three, four weeks ago now. It's taken quite a long time for them to ship it. But yeah, this is, you can just buy this. It's not a Kickstarter. So this is a, it is a done deal. This is the printer already selling as far as I'm aware. Let's get into getting it all out the box. Oh. So we've got this timer today. So because I want to start timing how long everything takes, oh, it can be quite difficult to do by just scanning through the live stream. So I'm going to put this timer on. And then I've got a timer of when I started doing things. And hopefully that will help you know how long I've been building and also me know how long it took overall. Again, we've got this really standard packaging. I'm not a huge fan because it's not recyclable. I do say this every single time. Some nice fancy cardboard packaging would be really appreciated, but I understand that this is probably cheaper. We've got a spool of white PLA. It's a small spool, it's not a full size or anything. Probably 250 grams would be my guess. 200 grams, it, it actually says on the label. If I'd read it, I'd have known. It's probably not super great quality, but it's nice that they like, include it for those that are getting started and maybe didn't know that it didn't don't, that they don't normally come with any. Anyway, there's some, there's some filament in the box. We've got some instructions. Hopefully they're going to be sufficient. It looks quite thin and there's quite a few languages, so hopefully that's not too bad. Did I say hello to everyone? Oh, hello everyone and welcome. You probably missed it. Uh, this looks like there's not a lot of assembly to do. The entire assembly is one page. So let's hope that's all they need, all I need, because there isn't any more. I'm guessing this is going to be very much pre-assembled. Got quite a chunky box of extra parts here, so... Uh, smells a bit... Oh my god. Something smells really peculiar. Uh, 
I think it's the power cable. Yeah. That's not super pleasant. Ah, okay. So we've got four really rusty looking screws. They're looking a little bit past their best already. This is why uh, screws that you'd normally find uh, in boxes from like Creality are covered in oil because they ship by sea. So obviously very humid air, quite slow transport, nothing really sealed. So everything gets, well, if it's gonna rust, it'll rust on the way here. So that's maybe a bit of a lesson learned there. It's good that they're probably, well, they're steel because they've oxidized and you can see all that rust on them, but not great in terms of the uh, overall performance. These have not rusted. They're a little bit more greasy. Standard kind of side cutters that you expect to find in packages like this. Nothing particularly special, but again, typically with 3D printing, all you need them for is cutting zip ties sometimes, and mostly for cutting filament. So I don't think the rest of the box doesn't smell. It's just this. I'm pretty sure it was that power cable. Also in the box, this is very Creality looking. Isn't this the normal spatula you get with the Creality stuff? I swear it is, like I've already got a couple of these. I'm pretty sure I got them with the end of threes that I had. It's looking a little bit grubby, if I'm honest. It doesn't look like it's, like it looks kind of damp and watermarked. I'm pretty sure this was a new unit. Strange. Bunch of zip ties. Not sure why they're not in the bag, but anyway. That's the kind of stuff. I'm not gonna use most of that now. Comes with a USB cord as well. In this bag, you've got the spool holder. I don't know why I'm, I'm like hidden behind all of this and you can't see <laughs> I'm obviously out of practice. It's been two weeks. Or three weeks? It's been a while. It feels like a while. Or was it last week? I have no idea. Uh, so this obviously is for that. These screws look like the wrong size. It looks like they've got M4 screws in an M5 hole. That probably will work. In this other bag, we've got... We shall find out soon enough if it's worth anything. Guarantee. Okay, the guarantee and an acupuncture needle in the same bag for some reason. This bag's got a hole in it for some reason. There's a PTFE tube here. I think we might need that, but I'm not planning on needing any acupuncture soon. A fairly substantial set of tools considering the instructions are just one page. It's a little bit worrying. Standard kind of tools you expect to see on a printer that requires 10 hours of assembly. Um, you've got a micro SD card. It looks like the branding has been scratched off of the tops. <laughs> This, <laughs> this is odd. This is getting strange already. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you can see across the top there. The, the branding looks like it's just been scratched off for some reason. No idea why. Scratched off or covered over. But it looks like it's been done by hand, which means someone's manually like scrubbing out on every single one. Okay. <laughs> and then it comes with this little micro SD card reader. Hopefully that'll do the job. Let's give it a quick try. Well, that worked absolutely fine. Comes with a user guide, a sample G code, some troubleshooting steps, software and a USB driver. So user guide, some executable in the, oh, that's probably a USB drive, oh no. Interesting. You've got the USB driver for the board, presumably. Installing, guide, instructions for assembly. Model, spell M-O-D-L-E. <laughs> No, 
not sure we're going to need much at the moment. Mine took 10 minutes for unboxing to the first print. Love this machine. I will probably take a lot more than 10 minutes. <laughs> but, you know, I'm showing everything, not just looking at everything. That's my excuse anyway. Uh, two nozzles, they're unmarked as to their diameter, so... Assuming 0.4, and it's got a PTFE coupling in there. Don't know if that's needed for assembly. This is really in the way. Okay, I think we're looked at accessories quite enough now. Uh, that's already taken seven minutes. <laughs> Oopsie daisy. Do I normally get everything out first and then look at stuff? More packaging. More packaging. Thou. Okay, this... <laughs> Well, I said it looked a bit like Creality. Oh, I can't really see super well. I didn't expect it to be quite... I'm, I'm guessing here, Creality has been an OEM. And Lotmax have purchased the printer from them and are rebranding and selling it. Somewhat ineffectively, by cost, I would assume. I don't know, this is odd. Like, everything is identical. All this is just looks completely end of three but the build quality is not so great this is, this is truly bizarre so let's carry on trying to get this all out of the box oh that's all joined okay Oh man, this is going to be a challenge, I think. I'm going to have to stand up for this bit. <sighs> it's going to take me 10 minutes just to get this darn thing out the box, let alone assembled. It's not super handy that they're like permanently connected together, I must say. I'm sure it's great for new users, but the unboxing is uh, challenging as a result. Right. Whew. Okie dokie. Everything's just kind of grubby and dirty. The wheels don't... The wheels could do with some strength. That, look, that one's really, really tight. That's... So there is a, what looks like a filament sensor. Oh, I really should have put gloves on. Yeesh, right. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a filament sensor over here. I'm sure this is what this is. Filament detector. Everything else just looks exactly like a Creality design. I mean, the Creality Ender 3 is open source. I, this is a bit bigger than an Ender 3. Oh, switch between 230 and 115 volts. Always important to do, but I've never had to do it because everything always comes as 230. Uh. Yep, it's on 230 volts. So before we actually do any building, let's do what we always do and take it apart. Step one, disassembly. Step two, assembly. They've actually used crosshead or Phillips heads. I don't even know which is which. For some reason, not an Allen key. I've got this weird stubby screwdriver. Never really use normal looking screws, so. Have to do with this. 
Oh, <laughs> I think we're going to have a nice little surprise with the power supply. I did have a very quick look online. Uh, we'll see. Which printer kit that I've assembled has been the most fun? Uh, well, we've got an interesting one, maybe two in the upcoming weeks. So those could be contenders. But for the ones that I've already assembled, most fun is easily the Mark III. That was a couple of years ago now, but still my best. Because it was just the most building. Ender 3 is reasonably good for those that are... Uh, not maybe super confident, but like to have a bit of a challenge with some building. I mean, it's not difficult, but there's a lot more steps in building an Ender 3 than there is. Like this one, for example, doesn't look like there's a whole lot to build. It looks like four screws. The Prusa Mini, again, that was very minimal screws. A couple of wires through some holes and that was it. I like the fact that the uh, Mark III was just like, you just do the whole thing. <laughs> Man, isn't this just the worst? Okie dokie. So we got sheet metal design. Feels like that would be steel. So sheet steel, 1.6 or something millimeters thick. <sighs> Does actually say mean well on the power supply. So the reason I was going to have a good laugh at this is the... Uh, Online, it says, like, we use famous brown power supply, and then it says from Ming Wang or Ming, Ming Wei or something like that. So it's how they use MW on the branding, but it says, like, Ming Wei as, like, a Chinese um, clone of Ming Well. But that doesn't look like it's actually the case. So it does actually say Ming Well. So 350 watts as well, that could be reasonable. This looks very familiar. What other printer was laid out exactly like this one? All of them. <laughs> the artillery, I think, was very similar to this in terms of internal layout. So, okay, 350 watts, 24 volt power supply. You got the switch and fuse over this side. Let's see if I can get a look. Uh, So it's a 10 amp, 250 volt fuse. Then we, they kind of use the American style for red live and black neutral and earth is yellow green. I think they use earth yellow, that earth is flimsy compared to the others, but should be sufficient. That all looks reasonably well connected. Fairly happy with that. They are a little tight, so maybe, um, they're not too bad, I suppose. It's not going to move anywhere, so that's not too bad. They have got a nice earth connection to the case as well. I don't know if that's going to transfer into all the aluminium parts, because this is obviously powder coated. But apart from that, it seems OK. Just double check on this earth connection, whether there's... So because the powder coat itself is not conductive, you do have to strip off that powder coat in order for that to work. And it looks like they've mostly done that, so that's reasonable. It's not totally um, clear, but it should give a good enough connection for that earth connection. This is good angle. So if we take a look over at the control board, we have what looks very much like a MakerBase MKS style board. You've got a port here for Wi-Fi that's not used. And that looks like a Bluetooth antenna. 
So there could be some potential interest there. I'm guessing you can plug in a Wi-Fi and then you'd need to modify firmware to use that. Stepper drivers looks like you've got two of one type and two of another. So, oh, these are so small they're difficult to read. So this is 2208. So it looks like they're going to be two 2208 stepper drivers and two looks like A4988. It looks like they've used... Oh, you can't read these because the uh, chip's on the bottom. I'm going to guess they're A4908 because those are cheap. And that's probably going to be yeah X, Y, Z. So Z and E, you've got 16 micro steps. And these two, you'll probably have the interpolated 256, I would hope. You've got an STM32F103 board. So that, of course, is 32-bit, which is good. Connectors-wise... They're not the highest quality. They're definitely not genuine connectors. You've got, having just released that connectors video, it's actually really difficult to re remember the names of them all. JSTXH, I believe, are these larger ones here. XH here, XH for all of these. These all seem reasonably well done. They've all got glue on them, which is a bit disappointing. I can understand it's better for, to have glue on them than for them to come out during shipping because then you've got users that are not super confident having to go in and plug stuff in which is not great, but locking connectors would be even better. Strangely, they've even done that for all these screw terminals on the back here, so that's not super fantastic. Tobias, thank you for subscribing. I, I don't know if that's necessarily people watching the stream or um, just watching videos. Uh, this is really difficult to get in the right place. I can just do this. If I also raise the back up a little bit. There you can see, so there's a whole load of glue around those connectors, which is a bit weird because normally even Creality don't do that. So I could also see that they've not used ferrules. Those are just bare wires. Not super great. Let's check if they're tinned, actually. Solder. If they've put solder on the end, that's also not super great. Doesn't mean I have to remove this plastic. Oh. <laughs> also, I've had recommendation to use um, IPA to remove hot glue, but I've not tried that yet. I don't know if it's going to be a super gloopy mess or if it's just going to come off. But either way, I've not tried it. Oh, I'm worried I'm going to cut the wire now. Oh dear, I was hoping this is just going to be super easy, but it's super not, especially from this weird angle. Tell you what, I might just be able to pull this connector out immediately as it is. Well, that's weird. They've been soldered. So the wires have been soldered and they've been compressed. This is not great. The hot glue's all over the place as well. It doesn't seem like the standard hot glue either because it's really, really flexible. It might just actually be like an epoxy or something rather than hot glue. I'm making an absolute mess of that, but let's get that back, connector back in there. So that's not great. Tin, tinned wires tend to deform over time because the solder kind of runs. It's like a very, very slow moving liquid. Oh yeah, good idea. Anyone that's watching, why don't you give it a like? YouTube channels should be more focused on build quality and electrical safety. These videos are one of the few channels I've seen doing it. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, from my point of view, if I'm going to recommend something, I don't want to recommend something that could be detrimental to a user. So I think, I feel, from my perspective, if I don't provide that, then 
I've not done what I should have done. Having good print quality is one thing, but if it's at risk of fire, then that's not so great. So this is this ribbon cable is just for your LCD. It's not the kind of two processor type. This is literally like mother daughter board. So you've got this is literally an LCD with the ribbon cable. Um, ports you've got micro SD and the standard USB type B port, isn't it? The uh, the big fat one, the big like square type. This line. Uh, other than that, I think it's actually not too bad in here. Let's make sure that earth connection's nice and tight. Time will tell how well it performs. Those solid terminals, not great. Other than that, I think that's reasonable. This fan, I'm a little bit concerned <laughs> of how, A, how noisy it's going to be, and B, why, <laughs> like the way they've wired it up. Let's put, prop this up again. The way they've wired this, you yeah, probably can't see. But the way they've put these and the wires coming in, the wires just totally cover that fan duct. So if anyone didn't open this and was expecting some airflow over these heat sinks to help keep them cool, it's just not going to happen because those wires are just covering the whole lot. They either need to be held down or they need to be longer or go around the back or something because in their current position oh damn it i knew that wasn't good <laughs> in their current position it's just not going to do anything it needs more zip tying down or to go over the top perhaps perhaps we can put put it up there and that will allow some airflow anyway i think now we're going to on to start actually building it Oh, well done. I'm just reading it. Maybe you should remember upgrading the Ender 3 with a genuine V6. Over 100 print hours. Zero clogs or any problems. Nice work. Nicely done. Can you check how the mains are wired? I did I did look at the mains at the start of opening. You probably have to, if you just rewind like five minutes or so, to 10 minutes or something, you should be able to find that. Overall though, it's, it's okay. It seems okay to me. The I didn't look closely at the crimping actually because that may be one thing to look a little bit closer at. I wouldn't say I'm an expert when it comes to crimping. Like this to me looks a bit not super great. The electrical connection seems fine. The mechanical one, maybe not so much. I don't think there's gonna that's going to be a massive problem. They've used, at least used decent terminals that are going to fully cover the terminals. Terminals that are going to cover the sockets, plug. I forget. <laughs> Even after making a video, I forget all the right terminology. So apologies for that. But yeah, the crimping on the power wires looks much better. It's just the earth connection that's maybe not as good but it does have fine electrically. Everything is wired in the right spot as well. Unfortunately, they've gone for the American standard of black and red rather than blue and brown, but that's kind of by the by, I think. So now we just need to get this back on in the right place. Interestingly, I've seen some comments recently about airflow in these sorts of enclosures. They have done a cutout Oh, what's gone funny with the focus there? Um, yeah, they've got a cutout for the main fan, but not one down here where it should vent out. Hopefully there's going to be a nice low noise, high quality power supply from Meanwell. But oh, just because the power supply is good doesn't mean it's going to be low noise, unfortunately. Some applications just don't call for it, so it's not a concern. But for us, it is a concern. We all like quiet printers. On the Creality CSX SE, oh, CSX SE will be coming. I'm like right at the bottom of the list for shipping for some reason. Obviously they've done it by, because I got add-ons, so that immediately pushed me all the way to the end. And then I'm not in the USA, 
So I, once I've done all the USA ones with add-ons, then I'll get mine. But even shipping, I think, as far as I can tell, is taking a little while from that time. So could still be a few weeks for mine, unfortunately. It's kind of sad, but there you go. We will we'll get there eventually. And you trust me, we will be scrutinizing the electronics on that. Uh, so on the CS6SE, as I was reading, only the live is switched via the switch due to this and parts Europe use the unpolarized connector. You could actually end up switching in neutral. So this is one thing on this as well, because so they have put, oh, I want to double check it now. Yeah, they do always nearly use switches that only switch one side. Now, strictly that does stop the connection. Of course, for electrical current to flow, you need a full circuit. So this switch does only switch the live side and not the neutral side. Whereas the standard IEC connectors that you that I always put on my printers, the switch has four terminals on it, two in, two out. So it always cuts both the live and the neutral. I'm not what, sure what standard it is exactly. Isn't IEC a standard? So maybe that is the right way to do it. I think I'm going to have to look a little bit deeper into those electrical standards to identify exactly when both should be cut or both should be switched. I am a backer. I've got no special treatment from Creality at all. <laughs> Not even. I've never been contacted by Creality. So, yes. No special treatment there. I shall just get it when I get it in order in line with everyone else. Oh, thank you for the uh, comments on the connector video as well. It's really, that was a bizarre video. For a start, I thought it was going to be terrible. Like, I've, I've wanted to make it for quite a little while. I thought it would be a good idea. And then like 24 hours before posting it, I was like, I think this video is really, really bad. I'm not sure I want to post it. And I did anyway because I was like, okay, well, I might be wrong. So I normally am. So I posted it anyway, and apparently everyone enjoys it. But it's strange because YouTube is like, you, as with like my last 10 videos, YouTube just doesn't want to recommend it. They think, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what they think I'm talking about, but they seem to not enjoy suggesting my videos. So uh, all the search traffic, all the, all the traffic rather, has come from Google search of all places. It's bizarre. But yes, it's doing, a, doing rather well, which is always nice when you put quite a lot of effort into a video. I put quite a lot of effort into most of my videos. Pretty much every video. Uh, have you ever had an FR4 build surface? I'm loving it really. It is so wonderful. It sticks so well and when you cool it down it's also easy to remove and affordable. PLA, PETG, TG, all good. I've actually got two like slabs of FR4. I've never printed directly onto it though. I'd like to know your opinion on how to make the... I can't even pronounce that. Hexdeco 3D printers, electrical safety better. I've never even heard of them, but if I had one, I may do that. This is exactly the same thing that Creality uses. It's just, it's all just so Creality. Ooh, there's a, there's a, re a removable bed surface. Yep. Oh, this looks... Speaking of FR4, I'm pretty <laughs> sure this is FR4. You can see the, like, fibre structure. Yes, yeah, just PCB material. I'm not sure... Is that going to make a very good build surface? <laughs> Isn't that really insulating? Only one way to find out. It certainly does flex reasonably well. I can just imagine it going a little bit too far and then crack all the way down. But it's got lots of fibre structure, so maybe it'll hold on reasonably well. I might just be wrong. I'm not a super big fan of these clips, though. This, 
white. They're designed to hold paper together, not 3D printers. Especially when on all my starting codes, which we might actually have a problem with later, I draw a little line, like much like the Prusas do. My start G codes will draw a line to prime the nozzle. I'll draw a line to prime the nozzle. And if these clips are on the bed, especially like this, they're gonna, they take up so much space. The nozzle will just run over this line. So that could be interesting. We'll see where we get to. <laughs> you know why it looks like a Creality machine except the logo? Probably because it is. At this point, I can... I, it's just so similar, like... It's incredible. Um, I've just lost the dashboard. Um, <clears throat> so, what's the assembly? Let's start the assembly. How, how far in are we? 33 minutes, and we haven't started assembly yet. M5 by 25 screws, four pieces. Then install the spool holder, then plug in the motors. I'm pretty sure they're all plugged in. They are all pretty much, there's only like one. <laughs> I don't think this is gonna take very long. One thing I've immediately noticed is the carriage is wobbling. I'll have to sort that out. It's again this annoying assembly structure type where you can't, you have to put screws up from the bottom, but that's never easy to do. And the screws are really, really rusty. <laughs> Oh. Well, I was hoping this was going to be easy, but <laughs> oh dear, the screws don't fit really. Oof. Screw barely aligns with the. This is not a very easy assembly. Okay. This is one of those situations, a bit like the Prusa Mini had, where he's got a small number of screws, so you think, oh, well, that'll be easy. But easy assembly is not just down to how many screws you've got. Right. I really should have got this out beforehand. Oh, that's not the right size tool either. Okie dokie. <laughs> the Prusa mini build was a little bit difficult. There was clearly, there's got to have been something I was doing wrong with that. But by all accounts, not as many people has as much difficulty as I did. Uh, let's go 
اسحب حيث اسحب حيث نبي سيئة ذو ذو There are five screws. What? I think it, to do this, you really have to have it on the on the Allen key first to get the control to get it through the hole. That is, of course, if it will go. There we go. I don't use Cure actually. I, I'm thinking of changing Slicer though. I tend to try and use one for everything. I just find that easier, but it's becoming more and more difficult to do so. So yeah, I might be starting to look at Cure a bit more, or maybe uh, the old Idea Maker, the Raise 3D one. So that's that all sorted. And then we've just got some things to plug in. So that's your Z minus end stop. You got the Z motor around the back. That motor's plugged in, that's plugged in. This looks really mangled and twisted, but also sort of okay. Y motor is plugged in. No, that's the Y end stop. Y motor. That looks Good as gold. And now we just got to sort this monstrosity. So let's pushing that thing up. Generally not a good idea, apparently. But PTFE is pretty flexible. So. I wouldn't say it's surprisingly flexible, it is just flexible. Oh, did I miss a super chat? Oh, well, this is not good. <laughs> what is going on? I think it just doesn't fit. I'm pretty sure I've turned it all the way around. <laughs> it doesn't fit. It doesn't tighten. It's just, oh, it was already looking at kind of the right place. The whole thing just doesn't work. That's going to be a bit of a disappointment, isn't it? That's the smallest amount of motion possible. And it just rattles. Oh dear. Right. So, let's see if we can fix it. 
I'm guessing something is bent. Yes, I can see it's bent. Holy moly. Yeah, so the reason it doesn't work... We're going to have to try and fix this. So the reason it doesn't work is in order for the wheels to kind of clamp onto the rail, they need to be parallel. As soon as they're not parallel, it increases that contact distance. And no matter how far you move it, as you go around the circle, it just doesn't come close enough to touch the rail. So it's bent. And they didn't catch that during assembly. So that's a bit disappointing. That immediately tells you quality control could do with some improvement. Or shipping. Ah, I reckon it's actually shipping. Because this was pointing right at the top. I reckon something's hit it, jammed it downwards, and bent that wheel. That's my guess. So, uh, can't remember the easiest way to disassemble this. Um, hot end. I think this. So, technically, we would have kind of finished the assembly there, but. As a result of this quality issue, we're having to take care of ourselves. It's not as finished as it should be. So if we take that off, take that off. I cannot catch a break. Okie dokie, we're going to have to do more than that then. This is not looking good. If there's one area of my tools that could do with improvement, it's uh, these sorts of things. Just never have the right thing. Honestly, I'm not totally surprised by this because the remainder of the quality of the machine was a little bit suspect. You probably can't notice it from the stream because it's in the little details that you notice these sorts of quality things, but yeah, that's really, really bent. I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to show you this. It's incredibly bent. It's more bent than I even thought it was. Right. So if I grab some pliers, hopefully I can just bend this because it's hopefully aluminium. Oh, it's not looking optimistic. No, I'm not exactly sure what it's cloning at the moment, to be honest, but it's definitely, to me, all of these parts are into three parts. The fan shroud, the hot end, it all just looks into three. The hot end's totally balked as well. The whole thing is just bent and buckled out of shape. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. We're not having a good day here, are we? <laughs> this is, let's see if I can show you. It's probably gonna be really difficult. I'm not sure I'm, it's gonna be clear enough for you to see this, but we'll give it a shot. Can you see from that how bent it is? I'm not sure it's super easy. No, it was delivered by DHL. But this is, 
I'm not sure I'm going to be able to unbend this, to be honest. I need a vise to do that. Don't think I can <laughs> give it a go, but I don't think I have the grip strength to do this. Oh no, turns out I maybe do. Okay, I've overbent it now. Okay, I think I've bent it too much back in the other direction, but it will work with bending too much, but it won't work with not bending enough. Right, now let's see if we can get this back on this printer. The wheels have contact points, so it doesn't really matter if those points are not straight. Well, it doesn't... Obviously, there's some adjustment, but there's only limited adjustment. There's, it's not infinite. And it was so far off that even... Oh, I need to put this on as well. What I could do wouldn't have been enough, so... Uh, Probably easier to do this once it's all back on the printer, but I'm doing it now anyway. Nothing quite like fixing a printer before you get to use it for the first time, is it? Good evening, RX from you. Hot end's looking a little bit more straight now. Yeah, I think... Hmm. I think the hot end maybe actually was okay-ish, but this bottom panel was so bad that it was difficult to tell. Uh, definitely should have done that in a different order. Okay, that's sort of on. <laughs> that's my version of assembled. No. <laughs> Fixed. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know if I would sell an Ender 3 Pro for this. It's basically identical, although it is a 32-bit board, I suppose, so there's that. I wonder if Lotmax is like a sub-company of Creality. That would be an interesting twist to the story, wouldn't it? Oh, I'm marring up my uh, tool. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Am I doing it the wrong way? No, I think I'm doing it. Okie dokie, so that's sort of better-ish. No, we don't want this wheel too tight. Oh, okay, that's too loose. It's still too loose. And we're there. So now we should be able to get everything back fitted as it was. screwdriver 
and this will be fine. Okay, that's looking good. Let's get this back on. Shove this back in here. Right. Oh, Marlin Firmware, good afternoon. <laughs> the world of budget printers does indeed expand continually. All the time people want to buy cheap stuff. People will keep making cheap stuff. <sighs> Fortunately soon, we've got some more expensive stuff coming. <laughs> <laughs> the firmware is talking about. The print. Well, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? The, the, end, the end stop for the Y motion is pulling on the cable. Yep, that's how you just stop in the Y direction. You just pull the cable until the cable won't let you go any further. Wires, not cable. And then, and then you just stop because the wires won't go any further. <laughs> oh man, that's not good. That is not good. <laughs> just, there you go. I've just about pulled it to its absolute maximum. That's a bit of a safety concern, not just a little bit either. That's quite a big bit. Okie dokie, so now that we've had some fun with that. Ooh, this is strangely warm. Oh, because it's by the heat up. But... V-rollers on the bed. Yeah, the bed's, the bed's fine. Apart from whatever it is that just came off underneath. They're definitely tight enough. I suspect they're actually too tight. But I'm not going to worry about that because that's just excessive wear rather than doesn't work. So for right now, not my problem. Where's the power? Oh, is it over the other side? It's conveniently placed on the wrong side. Being picky, there's not really a right and wrong side. Uh, it's just inconvenient for me. Right, what's the probability of explosion? Or magic blue smoke, or other undesirable outcomes? You can get that Mini X1 for like $75 on Banggood now. Very, very cheap. But also not super great. It's a toy, basically. I'm always nervous about reaching over something like this, just in case something does go wrong. I hate that beep. Why does it do that beep? <laughs> the, mo the most unnecessary beep. I just turned it on. I can see that it's on. You do not need to beep at me as well. Okay, so. Interesting little screen. It looks like one of those really old school ones, but it's it's not. <laughs> oh, more, and there's nothing on more. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Let's get some preheat. There's no preheat options. We're just straight into... Oh, they've got... 
I swear on the other printer, this is plus. Touchscreen is decently responsive though. It is a... Yeah, it's, it's a contact one. Do you call it resistive rather than capacitive? Capacitive like your phone where you just use your fingertips. Resistive when you have to have some actual force. So if we preheat to 210, and we'll also preheat the bed actually as well. Can't remember what my PLA settings are, I think 60. While that's doing that, I think it'll be best to level it as always while it's clean. So before we add material, we will wait for it to heat. These are weird logos for the leveling. It's actually not a monochrome screen. Well, unless I've understood LCDs properly, it's, it looks like it would be. So uh, let's see if I can, because the screen's at a daft angle. Well, it's probably a good angle for users, but there you go. it's actually just yellow and black. I reckon, are there more settings for the screen? Oh, that didn't do anything. It has got a bunch of languages, that's kind of nice, I guess. So if you wanted it in German, which one was language? This one? So I've got <laughs> some version of Mandarin, Chinese, presumably, rather than Japanese. German, English, Russian, Italian, French, and Spanish. Turn the matches off. Fan control, which is over there for some reason. About. So type is SC10, firmware version 2.0.6 from Shenzhen Senma 3D Technology. And they have an email for service at lotmax.com. Filament swap. Don't need to worry about that. I'm just going to do it manually. I reckon if you use SD card, change the config for this type of thing, then you could quite easily change that to be a more colour. Yeah. I changed the uh, the colour scheme on the Formbot upgrade fix machine printer thing to have like black and white looks pretty neat so what we're we doing homing let's do that need a piece of paper and also i learned this week if you uh, level a printer using paper with ink on the ink will come off onto the bed, so don't do that. It leaves a little black spot, because presumably it's at such a temperature that the ink no longer is dry. It just comes off. But then you can't, like, scratch it off. So, what do we do? Home. Now, I'm going to assume it's going to home just fine. Ooh. Z is a little bit noisy. Obviously, Z um, is the A4988. X and Y motion, pretty quiet though. That's nice. Fans also reasonably quiet as well. They really should just change that for a 2208. It really, really, really. Oh, this is going to be difficult with these clips being now super hot as well. And it looks like it has been tested because there is some melty filament coming out of the nozzle. Blimey. Well, that's a surprise. It looks like the... It's like almost perfectly levelled already. What is this nonsense? Uh, Levelling, point one.
should be just above the screw. It's a little bit further in from the screw. I prefer it to be just above the screw. That's my preferred place. But that seems reasonably good. This is really well adjusted. Well, I say well adjusted, I mean the whole hot end was balked, but it doesn't take much leveling, which is nice. It all seems to just be going, oh, that one's not so good. Uh, the Z axis at the moment is not falling down on its own. But then it's obviously powered, so. I mean, it was not falling before, so I assume no. They don't normally with motors. I wouldn't expect a motor based axis. Oh, hello, this is weird. 10. Why diagonals? No, wrong logo. Why is it diagonals? These are going in the right direction. That's sort of the right direction. This is just not the right direction. So I'm going to print this Benchy. It's a one hour print in PLA. So we'll have an hour of question and answer time. Oh, I forgot to fit the spool holder. Oh man, right, let's fit the spool holder quickly. I knew I'd miss something. It does have the filament sensor as well, so that should be uh, good. I'm not going to have the right thing for this, not going to be that, is it? Nope. Yeah, my, this is not a full-size benchy. This is a scale benchy. My normal benchy, I think, is an hour and forty-five minutes for end of three. I scaled it to eighty percent or something. Someone just sent a. I oh know it's a subscribe. Probably somebody else watching the, the connectors video. That connects this video. It defies all my logic. All the stuff that I thought I knew about how to make a video. It's just like... Cool. That's a reasonably nice small holder, actually. Kind of smooth. Fairly easy. Nice brass insert as well on this connector down the bottom. You can't really see. So, where you... Uh, the back of this. Ender 3's... The original Ender 3 had this problem where, because the filament's coming from up high, it would get a lot of rubbing like this as it comes in and out. Eventually it would cut, oh, cut it like slot upwards and it would jam. But this one looks like it's not going to have a problem. If I can get the blooming filament through the blooming hole. That's reasonably painless. There's a little light on the end stop as well. It is literally... I'm, I won't have a look at this. I'm pretty sure... I don't recommend doing this to printers when they're turned on, by the way. Oh, this is not going to work. It's literally an end stop switch with a little roller on it. So, yeah, that's what that is.
that doesn't seem to be coming through particularly easily. Is it up to temperature? No, it's cold for some reason. Did it fail that? There's no status screen. Did I accidentally set it to zero? I think I must have done. Right, let's get this uh, file that I've pre-sliced. a little while to heat up. Maybe that's just my impatience though. Plenty of yellow oozy filament coming out now. So it looks like they've done some sort of testing on at least the hot end because you've got filament coming out. Let's pull this camera a little bit down again. Yep. Power supply is kicking up a bit. It's not too loud though. Oh, it's kicking up more. Right. And it's gone back quieter again. Ooh, don't recommend doing that. Not a good idea. So now we've got some preheat going. Let's see if we can start printing. We should have 3D Benchy. Confirm. So the screen, which you, oh, you can sort of still see it. Oh, there's a light down there. I can't see. Yeah. That's obviously the PWM light for the for one of the heaters. I think this is going to be one of those fans that just ramps up and down and up and down and up and down and never stays steady. It is nice and quiet on the XY motion. And it is also bigger than the standard Ender 3, by the way. Yeah, that power supply is kicking up a little loud again. But, I mean, it's, it's definitely not as loud as the Ender 3, but it's the loudest thing, which is a little bit unfortunate. So this is going to be about an hour, this print. So that's quite long. We've got a little while. Oh yeah, you can see it's colour screen now, of course. It's just a weird... I looked on the listing and I thought, oh yeah, they've got like a really old school monochrome LCD. But it's not. <laughs> it's just a horrible colour scheme. I guess they've gone yellow because their branding is like yellow and black. But it's not super great, is it? <laughs> Uh, Banggood didn't send me this one. I put there a link in the description below. Yes, sorry, I should have mentioned though. Uh, Lotmax sent me this one. So this is directly from Lotmax. I did forget to mention that. I do apologise. Yes, this was sent directly by this company. And of course, I've put an affiliate link to Banggood in the description because 
you can buy it from that. Yeah, I do apologize for not mentioning that earlier to any, uh, yeah, bit of a fail. I might have to put that in the description again. It's one of those ones where it took so long to get here that I forgot who sent it to me in the first place. But that's not a good excuse. I should have mentioned it. There's a bit of packaging stuck. So this is going to take a little while. Also, the channel is super close to hitting 1 million watch minutes in one month. That's insane. Up until a couple of months ago, I was doing like 300k absolute max. So that's absolutely fantastic. So thank you everyone who's been watching. These live streams do help a lot when it comes to watch time. Because obviously people tend to watch for quite a lot longer. It's the kind of how the format works. And yeah, they uh, connect us video. Also doing remarkably well. Super happy with that one. I wonder if, yeah. <laughs> I think this is going to come out very, very similar to the end of three. If anyone has questions about anything, now is a really good time to ask them. Also, leave a like if you've enjoyed the stream up to this point where we've gone through all the details of inside and the assembly process. I do try and do these once a week, apart from the weeks where I can't do them because A, either we don't have a printer or I have family commitments or something. I've not had a remote direct drive extruder yet. No. Can't really expand on that whole lot. No, I have not had one. Ah, tonight's filament is, well, I say provided by, I mean, I pay for it. It's from uh, Oosnest Materials. So Oosnest, if you don't already know, oh no, James, you know them, but for everyone else, <laughs> Oosnest, they've not given me this or anything, I've paid for it, but this is the Oosnest Royal Blue PLA. I'm going to use um, this colour for my testing, I think, going forward. Because I can get it in the same colour for PLA. I think it was ASA or ABS, PETG and TPU, all in Royal Blue. So if I'm doing comparison prints, then I can isolate colour from that as a problem. As determining which and which, because they all look the same colour. So yes, nice cardboard spools, pretty decent. It's not the very top tier filament in terms of uh, performance and tolerance, but it is really good. I've had great results with it. Used a lot of it printing face shields, so I'm confident that it's reliable filament. And I know exactly where it comes from. <laughs> so yes, very, very happy with that. Motion is really quiet. Overall noise levels are very much acceptable. Hour and 17 minutes. That's not too long. We've done, so this is going to be, it'll be about two hours, I guess, by the time we're two and a half hours, maybe. I am streaming from the UK, yes. It's just after 9 p.m. if that's what you were going for. A 3 watt 47 ohm resistor on the meanwhile power supply will silence it and be cool enough. Not sure quite what you mean by that. 
where, where would I put this resistor? And why would that make a difference? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying I don't understand. <laughs> Yeah, Uzinest are not particularly a 3D printing specialist as such. They're definitely much more focused on CNC. Specifically, their Uzinest, the no, the Work B CNC is their like flagship part assembly product that they sell. I believe that that would be called their flagship product. I think that's what they mostly do in reality, CNC. But they also do materials, so. This is going to take a little while. <laughs> this one, I just want like a fast forward button. <laughs> Done. Interesting. Here, the build volume says 235 by 235 by 280. Whereas I'm pretty sure it's two th 250 by 250 by. Hang on, what? That says 250. What size is this bed? <laughs> the bed is 250. That bed is 235. That bed is 235. Did I put the wrong data in? Is that in the middle? Not really. Oh, for the fan, I see what you mean. Yes, so because it's a 12-volt fan, it's basically, that would be like putting two 12-volt fans in parallel, in series rather, therefore giving 12 volts to each one, therefore fine. I mean, you could also replace it with a 24-volt fan. Twenty-five quid for five hundred grams does not sound like Uznest pricing. I'm not sure where you've got that from, but that does not sound like the prices from Uznest. That would be twenty-five quid for a kilo. That sounds more like Uznest price. Uznest PLA. So this exact spool, four in stock. £23.50 for a kilo. I'd say that's pretty good price. And it's decent quality. It's not any cheap, nasty rubbish stuff that doesn't print properly. Yes, Flex, TPU, TPU Flex is much more expensive, but I think TPU is much more expensive anyway. I will mention to Lomax that the power supply is a bit noisy and see what they say. It does seem odd, maybe, I don't know. Meanwhile, must be selling huge numbers of power supplies to the 3D printing industry at this point. They really need to start, well, <laughs> who am I to say what they need to do, but <laughs> it seems like it would be a good idea for them to have a power supply designed for 3D printers. Like these are all, I'm pretty sure you call them like LED power supplies because they're used in industrial applications for lighting, I think. But like there's so many 3D printers being sold. I'm pretty sure the Prusa Mark III power supply that they're now buying from Delta is like designed for 3D printers. Like that's their bespoke power supply unit. I can't imagine it's that difficult to design high quality 24 volt power supplies for 3D printers that are nice and quiet, nice and efficient, ideal for the power outages that we use and work really well. They could even have better plugs, more integration, like the 
power outage thing that Perusha uses. Like all these things could be done, I reckon, but just requires a bit of low left hand talking to the right hand. On the Formbot series, are you going to do an overview video discussing details and design choices? Uh, maybe, prob no, probably not. I might do a live stream if there's. So like I did with the Prusa Mini build the other week, because I didn't have a printer, I did that instead to try and make sure we have some consistency in the live streams. So if there's an upcoming week where I don't have a printer, I may take that opportunity to talk a lot more in depth for anyone with lots more questions about the Formbot Upgrade series printer. That The finale for that series, by the way, is gonna be on Wednesday, hopefully. There's been a very last minute problem. <laughs> Hopefully, fingers crossed, it'll all be sorted and the video will be Wednesday. If not, then you know I didn't manage to solve the problem in time and it'll be next Wednesday. I mean, there's the thing with that printer is the design choices are very complicated because it's not just because I'm making a video series about it. The design choices or overall concept choices can be a little bit different to what I would choose if it was just for me with no other influences. Like, I chose the Himera because I'd been provided it, needed to use it on a project, so it, that was a good opportunity to use it. Not that I wouldn't have chosen it, chosen it otherwise, but in this case it was because I needed something and that I hadn't used. Yeah, the meanwhile, I think the meanwhile ones are noisy because they're not designed to be used on 3D printers. So the ratings that they have are not necessarily suitable. I mean, if it is a 12 volt valve and a 12 volt power supply, that just seems like, why would you do that? I thought meanwhile are like a high quality electronics supplier. I can't imagine they do something weird and dodgy like that. Uh, there's, I've got a better way to see how noisy it is. Because with microphones, you've got this balance issue and everything, so it doesn't necessarily help. What I do have, though, is a decibelometer, <laughs> a sound meter. So I'm going to have to shut up for a minute while I point this at the camera. Uh, well, point this at the printer and show it on the camera. You'd probably hear my voice at the moment at 80 decibels. That's not the printer. Okay, hopefully that's a reasonable uh, measurement for how loud it is. This is probably, it's loud enough to be audible in the room, but I think in the next room you wouldn't be able to hear it so much. It's not so bad. In terms of stepper motor noise, it's basically nothing. Even the hot end fans here, like the park cooling and hot end fans, are reasonably quiet. It is all just... It's all just power supply noise. Could also be a little bit this one in the front that we saw earlier on that's cooling the electronics. But uh, oh, I've missed a few comments. Uh, question, many b texts boards are intended to run with the TFT. Might there be a problem when you print via the TFT since that is sending the G-codes over? One of the problems I'm by having counted. You have to be careful. It's basically like printing. Well, it's a little bit like printing over USB like from a computer. Typically we moved away from that because of Windows restarts and power management on computers. They're way more complex devices, so it's difficult, unless you're really into computers and stuff, to make sure that whatever they do is not going to stop that streaming of data. With a TFT, it's such a basic device that you have, well, the manufacturer, obviously, it's designed for 3D printers. They've designed it so it doesn't turn off. 
as long as you have a strong connection, which means no interference, no dodgy cables, no overheating and that sort of stuff, then there's not gonna be an issue. You do have to be a bit careful with the communication cable. If it's too long, it can look like it works and then doesn't after a little while and that sort of thing. But in general, if it's implemented fine, there shouldn't really be a problem with that. It's just a serial interface, the same as the serial interface on a board. It's just over a wire instead of just across a PCB. So in theory, no, in practice, I think there are some teething problems with the with those products at the moment for that reason, but nothing major that I've noticed so far. Just came here, looks Enderish. Any cool features? Uh, I believe it has power supply uh, cutout, power cutout. It's got filament detection, which is nice if you do printing with very large spools or very long prints. I'm going to lose my voice if I'm not careful. I might have to uh, start talking a little bit quiet. Uh, I'm losing track of all the comments. In a new, not yet released printer I received, the power supply is heavily overpowered. It has plus 5, plus 12, plus 24, and 48 volt outputs and a mains power bed. By me. If it's a power supply especially for 3D, uh, I doubt it's a power supply especially for 3D printers because I don't know of any that use 5 volts regularly. Obviously for USB output, but USB out, in. I mean, it's used to power the USB devices, but I wouldn't, I don't think a CNC based printer would have that many different voltages. You'd normally have maybe one for the heating elements, one for the board. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Check out the MW Meanwell ERPF. I shall do that. Trouble is, it's probably going to be really expensive, isn't it? <laughs> 47 pounds. Okay, it's not really expensive, but compared to a $200 printer, to spend 47 on a power supply would be quite a big ask. Oh, my jaw's really stiff. Excuse me. It's a fancy looking power supply. It would be nice to have a nice... Uh... So if anyone that's not looked that up, there's a mean mail uh, 400.8 watt embedded switch mode power supply. So SMPS, 24 volts DC enclosed power supply unit. But it's only available on back order, unfortunately. But yeah, that's the sort of nice looking product. So many atoms. There's atoms all over the place. Oh, I could post a link to this uh, power supply, I suppose. I'm presuming I'm allowed to post my own links in the chat. Did you mutter the words, Adam, you're an idiot tonight? I don't think I did. I've been on top form this evening. No accidentally abusing chat. <laughs> No making stupid mistakes. I don't know why I keep trying to do that. This bit on the front always, I want to pull it off before the print finishes. Print's looking uh, pretty good. Ooh, I need to give my voice a break.
Let's see if we can find. Yeah, but AliExpress, it won't be the same power supply, will it? Uh, I'm going to try and look for. Ah, CR20 looks very, very similar. Aha, the Creality CR20 Pro. That's only 220, 220, 250 though. Cool, it's very similar to CR20 Pro though, in terms of build. It has this, just, it has the same like angled screen, but the CR20 Pro has a little knob here. CR20 Pro has 40 by 40 instead of 2040. And the CR20 Pro is also not big. Uh, a lot of TFTs are designed um, with awareness of that, I believe. A lot of them have, well, if it's the ones like this one on this printer, they don't have an onboard 32 bit chip themselves. But a lot of the big tree techs have a chip on board and do a lot of their own processing or can do a bunch of processing. So they have on them plugs for expansion headers and that includes um, sometimes Wi-Fi and the filament runout sensor. That's something I found on the Formbot printer. So if you want a filament runout sensor, you can do it. You just have to do it through the TFT instead of through the control board. The reason you can't do it through the control board I believe is because it runs an M600 command to change the filament, which requires interaction from an LCD, which you probably won't have if you have a TFT. That's a lot of this for a not a lot of that, but hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> CR20, it was a 20 inch CRT. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, chat doesn't seem to have crashed for me. Corality's name is me. You're right, it's, it's all over the place. They have the Ender series, CR series, like numbers and stuff. I bet they're just like two departments and they just do their own thing independently. Sometimes they come up with basically the same printer, but neither of them talk to each other, so nobody knows. I've seen on uh, like, where was it? I think LinkedIn, a whole bunch of like more industrialized Creality printers that I'd love to take a look at. They're super cool. And like, yeah, Creality do not the best quality sometimes, but they do, the, their machines are quite good. Like Ender 3 is super, super popular. That's V2. Ender 3, that's... That's Ender 3 Pro, actually. The Ender 3 is over there, but still. Uh, I did never print... Ah. <laughs> Have I been sending all those Twitter links to just... <laughs> A dead link. Oh, dear. Silly me. Uh, let's see if I can. It's, it's a bit late now. No one's ever going to see anything anyway. It's past the. Uh, I can't even get to my own profile to see my own tweets. Let's see where that link goes. Yeah, it just goes to a video that's seven minutes long. That's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> oh dear. Oh well, we, yeah. Yeah, everyone's saying it's private link and can't watch the video. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I am an idiot. Uh, it wasn't my fault.
uh, trouble is I'm not watching the stream I'm watching it from the dashboard so I don't know if I have a link for the actual stream Yeah, for me it's a video. For everyone else, it just says this is private. <laughs> so basically, my Twitter, <laughs> my Twitter link is: Hey, everyone, watch this video. Or you can't watch it. <laughs> Oops, sorry. This is a little bit of a tight corner still. Despite that brass fitting, this is still not a super great arrangement. Yeah, so we've probably missed out on a few viewers tonight, unfortunately. Unfortunately, because of my uh, terrible Twitter skills. Destroyed may be a stupid question, but why does it look exactly like a Creality machine? <laughs> it's not a stupid question. I don't have a fixed answer to that question, but what I believe the answer is, is that it's because Lotmax don't design printers. Creality have designed the printer, and they are the OEM, so they build it, make it, probably box it into a Lotmax box, and Lotmax goes here. So... That would be my guess, that Creality are the OEM and Lotmax are branding it as their machine and selling it. It's a fairly normal thing to do, nothing dodgy about doing that, totally normal, totally fine. Just a little bit weird when it looks exactly like other machines. We're not sure exactly what machine it looks like, because it looks like lots of machines, but not exactly like any of them. So a little bit like CR20 Pro, a little bit like Ender 3. Sorry, I keep snapping this. It's probably making horrible noises in the microphone. You don't have to do anything of your own to have a Kickstarter. You don't have to do anything to have a Kickstarter. <laughs> Just because they are not doing the design themselves, it doesn't mean they don't have involvement or costs in that process. So they may be... This might not look exactly like any Creality machine because it isn't any Creality machine. It's just all the design aspects that Creality use, and Lockmax have gone, we like your printer, can you please make design one for us that's these dimensions and like this? And then Creality go, yeah, okay, we've got all the dimensions like this. We, well, we have this design, we'll just expand it for you by doing this, this, and this, and this. And then they'll pay them to do that, resell them, all that kind of stuff, and that's the, probably my guess of how that sort of arrangement would work. Or they're just buying stock and reselling it. I don't know. <laughs> it does say Lockmax on the sticker, so I'm guessing it will be a uh, take you to a Lockmax website. Let's get a QR code reader. Oh, I can never find it. It takes you to en.lockmax.com. Server IP address could not be found. Not ideal. <laughs> Could probably do with some improvement that. <laughs> Rick Roll. 
I don't think any company would risk having a Rick Roll QR code on their printer. <laughs> What I might do while I'm sitting here is tear off some of this hideous iron, like, not iron. There's like machining debris. Oh, that's never going to pick up on the lens, but. Is it going to want to focus close? Here, please focus on my hand and then look at this. There you go, that's sort of on camera. Oh, I dropped it. Oh dear, that's not good. I know it's here. Just very little shards of aluminium. It's the kind of thing that companies tend to ensure a remove because it does reflect a little bit poorly on them because it looks like really bad quality because it sort of is. In reality, I don't think anyone's going to harm themselves as a result of this. It's all fairly well hidden. It's just not super great. Oh, I can't get any more of that out. These can be really, really sharp though, so do be careful if you ever handle them. They could cut through your skin very easily. Ooh, I'm still happy to... Uh, with a different bed size and other changes, it's obviously a custom design rather than straight up rebrand. Unless it's just a creative design that they decided not to release. Or, I don't know, there could be, there's so many reasons it could be that I just don't know which one it would be. Unless we ask them. I could try asking them and we'll find out. What size drag chain did you use on the form bar X and Y axes? Cool, that's a challenge for memory. On the... Y axis is definitely a lot smaller because there's far fewer cables. I think that was 10 millimeter by 20 millimeters. And then I think the X axis is 20 by 25 millimeters. I think that is from memory though. Could be 20 by 20. Quite big though. The X axis does have a lot of components going to it. Once you've got BL touch, the motor, heater, sensors, fans, like there's a lot of wires, whereas the bed is just live, neutral, earth, thermistor. There's like five wires. Hopefully that helps. Yes, if it was coming, if it had any chance of going to the electronics enclosure, that would definitely be bad. Yeah, I don't even like the idea of having that embedded in my skin. That would be nasty. Is there a good way to improve a heated bed cable without proper strain lift without actually replacing the cable? Huh? You can't add proper strain relief without adding proper strain relief, no. If you want to add proper strain relief, add proper strain relief. <laughs> I'm not... I understand why you would ask that question because it can be some effort to do that and you want the, uh, the easiest viable solution to get what you need. But I'm, I'm not going to recommend anything that I don't think is a good solution. 
sorry. So the right thing to do is add proper strain relief. That's what strain relief is for. Yeah, it's not a common bed size, is it? 250 by 250. But depends how popular it seems to like. It could have been quite a popular printer so far, so maybe it'll just be a little bit more time before they start being available. It is one of the downsides, definitely. Of it, I think this is kind of common with larger printers. They're obviously more expensive. Like the printer begins more expensive. Add-ons are always more expensive just because everything is a little bit bigger. So there tends to be fewer of them and then that puts the price up even more. Or they're just harder to find, as you say. What's the current status quo of budget Core XY printers? Uh, so I had the Sapphire Two Trees. Sapphire Pro, was it? That was not great. <laughs> The belt paths were a mess. Well, that's maybe a little bit harsh. The belt paths were not ideal. They weren't straight, so you'd get some really odd geometry. It's only small, but it's odd. The hot end on that machine was garbage. The cable management was less than great. The extruder was an imitation Bontech, which just was not very good. There's actually a, another printer I saw online the other day which I won't mention because I don't know anything about it yet, but I might purchase that and take a look at it, depending again on what other opportunities there are for other printers. I do have a bit of a problem with over <laughs> too many printers at the moment. <laughs> That's going to be have to going to be a problem I have to sort out as well. Can't wait to get my linear rails to carry on building my mini Core XY. Ooh, linear rails. Linear rails are cool. The belt printer, I think it could be interesting, but I don't have one. I've not tried it. Belt printers as a concept seem a bit strange to me. But maybe that's because the designs I use don't necessarily benefit from that technology. But it'd be interesting to look at one. They certainly, they look a lot more... Well, they look a lot more sturdy for a start because they've got that kind of triangular structure. But I imagine there's a lot of there's a lot of compromise in the way that you're printing the part in order to have that ability to print continually. And I think that could be a major downside of those like slanted printers. But I would like to get one just because I think it'd be cool. Yeah, I might give them away. The trouble is, it's, it's odd to give something away. If I thought it was rubbish, which may be the reason I give it away, I don't want to give it to someone like, because it's rubbish. That just seems, it's almost like bullying, isn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep all the good stuff. You can have all the absolute rubbish that I don't want. Like, I'd rather give it to family. <laughs> it's like, I can't use this. Would you like to try? But again, it's like it's kind of like giving someone work to do. Like you can't just use it. <laughs> so I don't. I, I suppose it's an opportunity for learning, like it is for me. As long as you present it in the right way, you don't present it as a printer. Like this is going to be something that's great for printing on. They're like this is something that's terrible. It needs fixing. Gives you the opportunity to learn about things and try different things. <laughs> the garbage that caught fire. Yeah, I could give it to schools with the right... You have to definitely focus on that right mentality of though, this is not a printer, this is a problem. If you have students that are interested in STEM, they might want to try and fix it. They can look at all the different things that may be wrong, maybe the things that I could suggest to them, this is not great, this is not great, and give them an opportunity to find out why it's not great, learn about different motions and heating and electrical currents and voltage and all this sort of stuff.
Oh, I'm starting to miss loads of questions. <laughs> I haven't had mine shipped yet either. I've no I've heard that there's problems, like really bad, but and I know Creality have taken responsibility for it, which is quite open of them. I've not, at the moment I've not seen enough evidence to be absolutely certain that it's not the fault of the user. And but the problem is the only way I can be certain is if it's my printer, which is why oh sorry. Yeah. Which is why I can't, it's difficult for me to comment on a printer before I own it. I need to have my experience with the printer in order to say it's rubbish. I can't slam a printer for being rubbish based on some five second video of smoke coming out of it. Like, obviously, you tend to, it's nice to believe people are being honest and genuine and that was their experience and that's what happened. But when someone's filming something, turns it on and smoke comes out, okay, like, why were you filming? If you thought it was going to be absolutely fine, why would you bother filming it? Like, if you're not someone who takes video for a living, like, do people do that? This seems odd to me. But I, again, like, I can't, I can't really comment. I've already commented probably a lot more than I should have. I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm not saying it's Creality's fault. I'm saying I don't know until I've had my own experience. The only reason they're reacting because Naomi kicked their butt. Yeah, <laughs> she does keep them in check, doesn't she? Which is well, it's a really good thing about their relationship that they have and the way that she's helping them. It's a very Western thing to do to take ownership of something like that. That's it's quite a big step for from well, my cultural awareness of China is quite poor, but as far as I'm aware, that would not be a standard practice over there at all. Not even close. But then, again, it's totally a different culture. Like, you can't say it's, like, the wrong thing to do. That's just how they do it over there. Like, we do certain things in the West, they do certain things over there. Like, neither is right nor wrong, it's just different. I did hear of Creality releasing names on the Kickstarter baggers. In fact, I noticed it as soon as it happened. Because it, it was part of the CR6 SE shipping updates. And of course, I was getting those on a daily basis. So yes, I saw that immediately. I'm not sure which video. I've seen a few. I'm not sure if it's one that you shared with me or not. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to the fact that it could quite easily be a creality problem. That's absolutely fine with me. But it doesn't mean like either. Like I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. Unless you're filming twenty four seven, you can see everything they did with the printer, which I can. It's my own eyes. I can have my own experience. Like that's the point of that. This is kind of what reviewing is all about, really, right? You need to be, I need to be as honest as possible, and you need to trust me that I'm being honest. So when I do a review and I say everything went fine apart from this and this, that's me being honest about what happened. Whereas someone who's maybe not in my position or not doing the YouTube thing doesn't, doesn't have, haven't, hasn't built up trust with an audience, it's difficult to know exactly. Maybe you know that person, so you would trust them. I don't, like... We're talking way too much about the topic. About this topic. <laughs> the CR6 SE is actually for sale on Banggood now. But Creality have said that they will not ship those printers until they've finished sending to backers. So it could well be that it's up for order on Banggood, but it, the shipping, it says like 
a seven day, two week shipping or something, but doesn't ship for six to eight weeks. So that's probably on the basis that they know they're being manufactured, they get, get a consistent output, they know how many backers they've got to ship, and these orders will ship after that. So I'm not mad about the fact that it's being sold, that's not a problem. As long as all the backers, or at least 95%, like the majority, apart from the ones that are problems or in remote regions and stuff like that, as long as nearly everyone gets their printers before they're being sold online, that's fine by me. Now, hang on. Not that they're being sold online before they are delivered to the people that bought them online. I could buy one online now, but it will probably get delivered six weeks after the one that I bought uh, from them, from the Kickstarter. Yeah, this Wi-Fi box seems a little bit weird to me. I think doesn't I think Joel Telling has one, 3D printing nerd, so it'd be interesting to see what his experience is. For me, that kind of product is a little bit My my concerns for that are not whether it prints, but what it does, like how it's connecting, what servers it's talking to and all that kind of stuff. I would need to make sure that someone who's uh, more clued up on the whole internet security and stuff looks through it and makes sure that everything's fine. Like Again, I can't... It's just <laughs> trust thing, I guess. Having devices on my network that... From my, I, I guess I trust Creality as a company, sort of, but not enough to have one of their network devices on my network, unfortunately. I think we might be having a problem. It seems to be retracting more filament than it's feeding. <laughs> this is not good. It was, the print was looking fine up to this point. But I think... Is having a bit of a rough patch. It is doing Z-Hop. I set my printers to use Z-Hop on my slicer profile. Probably don't need to, but this is my slicer profile, by the way, not theirs. So if you have anything to say about Z-Hop, that's my introduction, not theirs. Z-Hop for me is something I integrated or started using or noticed was available or I don't know like the timing of when these events lined up but I was using Kira back in the day soon after they changed from their really old like version 15 over their new style and I had a lot of issues well well I had crap printers as well it was a long time ago but the movement in X and Y was knocking things off the whole time using glass beds so adhesion was not super fantastic if you get any kind of contact sideways it would just knock it off or throw over support material so as soon as that Z top feature was available for moving around that was an instant enable for me at that point and I've just not considered changing it since really oh we've not had a oh so First thing, thank you to Lotmax, of course, for sending this printer over to me. They've not paid me or anything to say anything nice. <laughs> I haven't said a lot nice either. Uh, this is their machine. 
that's now owned by me. They've provided it for the purpose of doing exactly this. If you have enjoyed the, if you have enjoyed the stream so far, uh, leave a like. Just like the thumbs up thing down below if you're not uh, YouTube regular. If you want to see more stuff like this, hit subscribe. I do live streams like this, so building printers, taking a look at the control board and everything inside, doing the assembly and first print. Tends to be Sunday evenings. Trying to get through as many printers as I can. Trying to look at all the different aspects, what's around, what's good, what's worth having. You can tell quite quickly whether thing, something's really bad or maybe worth a review. So that's a good opportunity to do this. If it's really bad, probably not worth a review, but at least I get an opportunity to say, I think this is going to be really bad. I'm not saying this is really bad. That's just <laughs> the concept of this video. And then Wednesdays is my regular upload schedule. So that's my pre-made, uh, controlled, what do you call it? edited content. So Wednesdays about five o'clock British summer time. 5 p.m. my time. Every single Wednesday. So Wednesdays for normal content, Sundays for live stream. Live stream's pretty chill. I've just noticed something slightly different. There's a cutout here. It's a U-shaped cutout, which is square on the end of three. <laughs> totally different printer. Uh, so yeah, that was <laughs> that was what I was going to say. Like, subscribe, lock max. Thank you very much. It is recovering a little bit now, but it did have a bit of a problem. I think maybe the... I'm hearing a little bit of skipping steps on this motor, although it is quite warm. Uh, where are the other motors? That one's hot as F. That's warm, that's warm, that's warm, and that's hot. Very hot. Blimey, Charlie. Okay, it's not, no, it's not hot, hot, hot. There have definitely been hotter motors. It's warm. Will you continue the series with the Fusion 360 tips and cables, drag chains and such? Um, I will definitely be doing Fusion 360 content, but it will probably be different. So... That series was mainly part of the Formbot upgrade series. I was basically, I didn't want every video to just be like Formbot upgrade part one, Formbot upgrade part two, Formbot upgrade part three, because they don't, they're not searchable. They're not, it's fine if you're into the series and you just want to watch every single one. But for people that are looking for interesting content or looking for a particular subject matter, those titles are kind of useless. So that whole Formbot series was structured so that each video was kind of a standalone thing. If you just wanted to watch something about drag chains, you can find something about drag chains. But for those people that are interested in the form bot, you have that kind of logical progression of I'm working on this, then this, then this, then this, and then I have a printer and then done. So you've got a nice kind of connecting series that works into a playlist, as long as independent episodes that work on their own. So at the moment, I'm not planning another printer build. They are a huge amount of work you would not believe and maybe you would believe if you've done <laughs> done those bills yourself, but they are so much hassle and challenge and difficulty, and the viewership from my audience just is not that great. So now that that's coming to a close in the next video, hopefully, there will be a slight change in the whole content format, but I'm about 99% certain Everyone that's currently watching will enjoy it. It's just a little bit different. Only a little bit. I, basically, what I'm going to try and do is integrate a little bit more engineering and object, objective testing. That's like what I'm trying to focus a little bit more on doing. So instead of going, oh, this is a bench sheet. It looks nice. And then this is a bench sheet. It looks great. This is a bench sheet. It looks amazing. It's so subjective, like anyone could say that one looks better than the other, even the colour can influence a subjective outlook. So I want to do 
testing, comparison of machines, printers, hot ends, etc. But objectively, like this one is better than this one in this parameter because this number is higher than this number. Something you can't, well, not that you can't argue, but is like the argument is not subjective. You're not just shouting, whoever shouts the loudest makes the best thing. You can say, for, for example, hot ends is a really easy one to identify. The amount of plastic you can push through a nozzle is the volumetric flow rate of a nozzle. Or, sorry, I should rephrase this. The amount of plastic per second or per unit of time that you can flow at maximum speed through the hot end, it's how the whole thing is its peak volumetric flow rate. So that's cubic millimeters per second or millimeters cubed per second. That is like ideal one of the ideal performance metrics parameters for a hot end. If a hot end does a thousand cubic millimeters a second and another one does 600 cubic millimeters a second, that intrinsic parameter of the hot end will limit the speed at which you can print. So if you have a printer that uses this 600 cubic millimeters a second um, hot end and says it can print extra fast and this one over here is saying it can print even faster, that's a sort of valid claim. But if it's the other way around and the 600 millimeters cubic millimeters a second says it can print faster than the thousand, it just can't. Even if the machine says it can go at 500 millimeters a second, if the hot end can't push enough plastic to actually print at that speed, it doesn't matter how fast the mechanics can go. So yeah, there's a whole lot of words to explain a whole very small topic, but objective testing is what I'm going to try and focus on. As well as all the other things, the live streams and stuff will all carry on. I'll probably change what I'm printing to be something that I can measure and go, well, this is good, this is good, this one's not so great. And then we'll do comparison to the enders or other similar printers. Yeah, so here you go. Prime example. Printer looks identical, volumetric flow rate issue, there's a jam of some kind. Hit the peak of the volumetric flow rate, which means this, for some reason, doesn't seem to be able to print as fast as the end of three. It's skipping steps, which means either the torque on the motor is not high enough, and therefore it's skipping, or the hot end design is slightly different, and therefore can't push as much plastic. In all my blabbing, I've missed a few questions, but it looks like it. Skip steps is due to stepper drivers, isn't it? Skip steps. So a, a motor will skip when it can't provide enough torque to do the job that it's trying to do. So that could either be because the demand is too high. In other words, it's trying to push more force than it should have to push. Or it can't push all well or the driver's not providing enough current. And basically the, it's either, <laughs> so if you've got a stepper motor in the middle, either you've not got enough coming into the stepper motor in order for it to do that, or that is too high in order for the maximum of this. Hopefully that's what makes sense. So either you can increase the power of the stepper motor by adjusting the driver or firmware, depending on how it's adjusted, or you can slow it down and that will reduce the amount of torque required in order to force the filament through the hot end. I've got a T-Rex 3. I regret buying that thing hard. <laughs> well, if you want to go through all the form bar upgrade things that I do, that might change some things for you. Oh, I forgot a word. Commercially available. Foldable or portable 3D printer. Uh, I, don't, I'm, mm, I don't know of one. 
I can't see many practical applications for such a thing, which is probably why they're not widely available. Not because of my opinion, I mean, because there's probably not many instances where a folding machine is a like valuable necessity. I would like to see a video that explains your linear rails and explaining some of the codes for tolerances and load ratings and what's actually required for an average 3D printer. See, that's one of those videos where I'm like, it becomes very, if I'm not careful, it's very just bleh, information. <laughs> There's a lot to understand in those sorts of things and they can become overly technical. And if it's overly technical, people just don't bother watching. Sometimes maybe because they think they don't want to know it or they don't need it or it's just too much, it's just unnecessary. Like people don't want to get a university degree on YouTube. Like <laughs> they just want some enjoyable information that helps them do what they want to do. And you're right, it's it's an interesting topic because linear rails can <laughs> they can hold a huge amount of load. So the ones on uh, I can't remember the exact spec, but the ones I put on extrusionator they do something ludicrous, like 400 kilos per carriage or something. 400 kilos per carriage. And, uh, and that's like 100,000 hours of functionality. Like, <laughs> and I'm putting six kilos on. Like, the demands of 3D printers are exceptionally low. That's why printing can be so cheap, because it's really slow. So the load rating, the, what's the term called? Duty cycle or duty rating can be basic. It's not industrial grade because the speed is low. You might only run them once for a few hours or a couple of days every week or something like. Speed's really low. Loading is really low. That's why they, linear rails tend to be a bit overkill, but also pretty cool. And they are good. It's just too good. The, the problem with doing a model that has a purpose other than objective testing is that you, like with any test, you need to eliminate as many variables as you can so that the thing that you're testing is the, the only factor that can change between one and the next. If you start looking at complex geometry for printing objective testing benchmarks, such as for measuring with calipers, etc., you have to be very careful that the geometry that's there can't influence what you're measuring. And with something that is quite complex, there's going to be a lot of factors that go into that model. Like if something's cooling too fast, it might warp a little. Different structures, you might have retraction issues on some bits. Like all of these things are going to affect how you finally measure that part and then it becomes subjective because you just look at it and go oh it looks better but is it like, is it really better so my my models for doing the testing that i want to look at I, i'm not going to reveal them all now i've got a few lined up that i think are really good some one technique that i found for doing some calibration is super promising and absolutely epic so that would be really cool, but at the moment I'm not revealing too much, but they are very, they're quite simple. They're not, it's not just a cube and stuff like that. It's a little bit more complex than that. There's quite a lot of thought that goes into why certain shapes are the way they are, but it allows you to do either calibration or testing. You can't really do both at the same time. If you're calibrating, you're adjusting geometry, adjusting like variables in the printer, etc., to determine an outcome, whereas testing is leaving those variables alone and identifying what the performance of those variables is. Ooh. We've done so much chatting, the print is done. I'm going to leave it to cool for a little bit. A regular layer line, skip steps. 
Oh, is this your T-Rex? Isn't the T-Rex the same carriage as the Formbot? I've designed a Hemira mount for that if you want it. I need to share those. In fact, I think I was only going to share them with the Patreon supporters. I don't have many Patreon supporters, but I think they deserve it because I've not been a great Patreon person. The bench doesn't look fantastic. Look, you're just in time for the comparison. Oh dear, this one's stuck. There we go. And there we go. So let's not get these mixed up. This is Ender 3 V2. This is Ender 3. This in the middle is the Lot Max. So we can just leave it as it is and try and zoom in on this. Printer timing is two hours and 18 minutes. So as I said, about two and a half hours by the time we've actually finished. If I move this now really, really close. Move the camera down. Right, down. Hopefully you can all have a good look at those. They look a bit overexposed, but there's not a lot I can do about that. Hopefully you can see them all right. From my perspective, I can probably see a bit more detail than you, so let me go through what I can see. So, this over here was the N3V2. Quite a bit of stringing actually in here. I've not tuned the retraction on this, so I wouldn't judge that too harshly in terms of retraction. Just a settings thing. This has been printed on exactly the same as this, so looks like retraction on the end of 3 v2 needs a little bit more than the original end of 3. This one over here is the what I'm calling the original end of 3 is in fact the end of 3 pro with the maker based control board so only really partly end of 3. The mechanics are all still original apart from the bed which is not original so it's not very end of 3 but it's sort of representing the end of 3 in this test case. This is actually probably the best of the three it has the least retraction. Overall, this all is all quite consistent, which looks good. I mean, these are my fairly tuned settings, so I'm not surprised that this one looks rather good. The one in the middle is obviously the one that's still stuck to the bed. This is the Lotmax SC10. Thank you very much to them for providing the printer for me to take a look at. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, the lower part is definitely very similar between all three actually. There is some slightly dodgy wobbly walls going on here but I think that's again an impact of the geometry and the curve up the front which kind of does some uh, weird contraction and uh, warping which results in that layer pattern. Uh, the most significant issue here is definitely retraction, in this case over retraction rather than under retraction. Uh, and a restart distance issue, I think. So you've basically got, an, due to this geometry, I think, over here, or maybe it's a result of this, but basically these two bits here are now really, really skinny. There's definitely a significant under-extrusion in this layer here. Well, these few layers, probably five or six layers, maybe, where it just was not extruding enough filament. That's where we saw some of these skipping steps. We saw that a little bit further up as well, actually. And that could also be related to either the torque here or some issue in the hot end, which I've not identified yet. Well, that felt really sharp. That was weird. My voice is really starting to go as well. So it's just as well that we're right at the end, and it's just as well I've already recorded my video this weekend. Whew. Well, yeah, it's, it's also Sunday evening, so <laughs> there's no more time to record a video. Uh, If I do a full review, I will, maybe I need to adjust my, how I run these and start using profiles that are provided with the printers. I do feel that, like I've not represented the printer fully as I've not used their profile. It used to be that printers weren't provided with profiles or that they were actually rubbish, but it does seem in the last year or so, this has changed a little bit. So I probably should take a look at slicing with provided profiles. 
So that's definitely something, if I do choose to do a review on this printer in the future, then that's definitely something we'll be taking a look at. We'll use the original slicer settings rather than just my quick slicing profile that I prepared before the stream. Have I ever played with a MakerBot, MakerBot clone, like one half flash wash? I've never used a MakerBot at all, ever. Okay, id, id, however, goodbye. Thank you. T-Rex 3 has a different extruder setup than Raptor. Carriage is different, it uses a heat sink. That is their design, no Raptor designs work on a T-Rex. Oh, so they've got two printer designs that don't have any interoperability. Or well, not on there, that's a little bit silly, isn't it? Okay, so I think hopefully that's a good enough demo of these prints. Let's take a, I'm worried I'm gonna, oh, let's try this heated bed out. Heated bed? I don't mean heated bed, I mean removable platform. So we've got the V2 and the Ender 3. So now we just have the Lockmax. <laughs> I think my first layer might have been a little bit close, but it's come off okay. I'll go for the ultra close up now. Wow, so close. 3D printing Belgium, have a pint on me. Thank you very much. That's awfully kind of you. Overall, I don't think it's too bad. It's definitely a slicer profile issue that's caused this. All the walls, in, in fact, look pretty good. Very similar to the Ender 3 and V2. Yeah, the, I mean, as you can see, the real issue here is the under extrusion in the pillars as a result of some either combination of skip steps and retraction, extra restart distance needed. At that point it was just, it was retracting more than it was pushing, so it just, <laughs> the filament came out the backwards way. That is an 80% scale bench sheet, by the way, not a 100% scale. So there we have it. I think that's gonna be it for today. If you're interested in a review for this, leave, well, you can't really leave a comment now, can you? Don't leave a comment. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not choosing reviews at the moment. My reviews tend to be quite long-term anyway, so as I get going with this more objective testing, uh, I'll be doing a lot more data collection on the printers I have. So there could be, if not, an isolated review, there'll be certainly more print comparisons and uh, objective analysis. That's the objective. The objective is to be more objective. So, yes. I did test the flex plate. I took it off and bent this off of it. <laughs> Fully tested. Yeah, reviews will be way more intensive in testing than this. This is never meant to be a review. This is a first look at, at best. I can't possibly review a printer in an hour, two hours, three hours. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's gonna damage something. Uh, so yeah, that's gonna be it for me today. As I mentioned, this was provided to me by Lockmax. I'm pointing at the box that's over there. Uh, so. Of course, thank you very much to them for sending it over. Very much appreciated, thank you. Hopefully this has been a great uh, opportunity for everyone to see what this printer is, well, capable of in some regards, 
but also what the experience is like out the box and the kind of hardware you can expect inside. This is, of course, going to be the end of the stream now. We're all done. All print is complete, obviously assembled, and we'll turn it off. Don't forget to... Did I already just say that? Don't forget to like and subscribe if you've enjoyed the stream. There'll be more streams like this one, building uh, printers or unboxing, building, doing the first print and doing that internal inspection on Sundays. So this sort of time, 7 p.m. GMT is the time for that. And then my normal Wednesdays, 5 p.m. will be the edited video. So this week, the plan will be to have the final video for the FormBot upgrade project. And if not, then I don't know what it'll be because I don't have anything else. So I may, may, might have to make something quite quick. But hopefully we'll get that sorted tomorrow morning and then everything will be fine and the video will, will be ready for Wednesday. So yes, thank you much. Thank you much. Thank you everyone for watching. And I shall see you in the next one.